So next we're going, to, we're going to hear from Katie Anderson, and she's going to tell us about stochastic gene regulation in the fly retina. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm from Johns Hopkins University. I'm in the Johnston lab. Uh, and today I'm going to tell you about how natural variation in binding site affinity controls stochastic gene expression and color perception in flies. So we often think of development as this highly reproducible process. Take these twins, for example. They're seemingly identical. But if we were to take a closer look, we would see that there are actually some pretty major differences. An example of this is the random distribution of red, green, and blue cone cells in their retinas. And this is achieved through stochastic gene expression. And there are several other examples of stochastic gene expression throughout development, but our lab focuses on the retina. So much like the human eye, the fly eye also exhibits a random distribution of photoreceptive cells. Here I'm showing the R7 cell that expresses either rhodopsin 3 in blue or rhodopsin 4 in red. And this is controlled by the stochastic expression of the transcription factor spineless. Uh, so as you can see here, um, these are R7 cells, and you can see that spineless is expressed in just a random subset. So in R7 cells that express spineless, we get activation of rhodopsin 4. And in R7 cells that lack spineless, we get activation of rhodopsin 3. And for the purposes of this talk, I'll be showing rhodopsin 4 as a direct output of spineless. So our lab is interested in asking what makes spineless expression stochastic. If we look at what's known about the locus, we, th we know there's an enhancer that drives expression in every R7 cell as well as two silencer elements that are required to repress spineless in a random subset of R7s. With all of these elements together, we get 67% spineless in our wild type or lab stock. So across a given genotype, we end up with the same ratio, uh, but different patterns across individual retinas. So here I'm showing just two examples of our wild type retinas. And you can see they both have a 67% spineless ratio, but vastly different patterns. And so a question I'm particularly interested in is what's controlling the ratio? So how can each R7 cell make its own decision, yet across a given genotype, we end up with a reproducible ratio? So to get at this question, we use the DGRP, which is a collection of 205 fly lines from the wild that have been inbred and sequenced. So to assess the variation just within the spineless locus, we took each DGRP line and crossed it to our spineless deficiency lab stock and then analyze the resulting spineless on-off ratio in the progeny. So the idea is, assuming that the SNPs are recessive, we'll be looking at variation that's just attributable to the spineless locus. So this is what the data looks like. Uh, you can see there's a wide variation. Along the x-axis, we have the DGRP lines in rank order by their spineless expression frequency. And you can see that it ranges anywhere from about 16 to 80% spineless, with this green bar representing what our lab stock would be. So we ran a GWAS with that phenotype data and the full genome sequences of each line. Uh, and this is our data. Anything above this red line is considered highly significant, which leaves us with this SNP up here. Uh, it's the only highly significant SNP from this analysis, and it's within spineless. So if I map that SNP onto the graph I just showed you, it's predominantly in lines with low spineless expression. As you can see by the light blue bars, these are lines that are homozygous. So we've creatively named it the low spineless SNP. So just to show you that data in a different way, um, I think you can really appreciate from this graph that there are two distinct populations. A population with the SNP that has a lower spineless expression frequency than the population without the SNP represented in gray. So to confirm the causality of the SNP, we started to look for it in other populations. And we happened to find it in two of our independent lab stocks. And in both cases, we see a similar decrease in spineless expression frequency. Very excitingly, we also found the SNP in two of our stocks that are derived from the wild in Africa. Um, and again, we see a similar decrease. And then finally, to really put the nail in the coffin, we used CRISPR to insert the SNP into a wild type line. And in three independent isolates, we saw a significant decrease in the spineless expression frequency. So we were wondering how this actually affects vision. Does it have a behavioral output? 
So to get at this question, I told you before that the R7 cells express either rhodopsin 3 or 4, and both of these are UV-detecting proteins with overlapping spectra. So that makes it really hard to assay for any vision differences. Fortunately, we were able to take advantage of the fact that the R7 cell fate is coupled to the R8 fate. So in R7 cells that do not express spineless, the neighboring R8 cell expresses blue-detecting rhodopsin 5, and in the R7 cells that do express spineless, we get activation of the green-detecting rhodopsin 6 in the neighboring R8. So to assay for color vision, we use a T-maze apparatus. Essentially, we have a blue and green light at the end of two blackened tubes. We insert a tube of flies into an elevator that is lowered, and they're allowed to make their decision. And after 20 seconds, we close off the tubes and count the flies. This gives us something called the preference index, or PI. And essentially, if uh, the flies prefer green light, then we end up with a positive PI. And if the flies prefer blue light, we end up with a negative PI. And our hypothesis was that the low spineless nip causes a low spineless on-off frequency. So we should expect to have more rhodopsin 5, and thus the flies should pre uh, prefer blue light. And indeed, that's what we see. Um, again, the lines that are homozygous for the low spineless SNP are in light blue, and they tend to have a negative PI, suggesting that they prefer blue light. And this is shown again uh, just in a different representation. There's a significant difference between lines that do and do not contain the SNP in terms of their visual preference. So what is the low spineless SNP? It's a single base pair insertion of a C, and it's upstream of the promoter in a relatively uncharacterized region. When we looked into it further, however, we found that it overlaps with a predicted binding site for Clumphus, of which the human homologue is Wilms Tumor Suppressor 1. So this clue site is actually perfectly conserved across all 21 Drosophila species, suggesting that, um, so this covers 50 million years of evolution and suggests that this site may be functionally relevant. Okay, so you might have noticed before that in the endogenous locus, we have a G where the preferred binding site uh, nucleotide is an A. So this suggests to us that this binding site may be suboptimal for clumpus. And you might have also noticed that at this last base pair position, it does not seem to prefer any one given base. So our hypothesis was that perhaps this SNP is affecting binding, but in a subtle way. So to get at this question, we analyzed some pre-existing select-seq data that people did for Clue. And what we found is that Clue seems to prefer uh, sequences that contain the low spineless SNP. And we saw this for one data set as well as the other three, um, again, suggesting that Clue binds better in the presence of the low spineless SNP. So next, we wanted to see if it's even expressed in the eye. Uh, so this is a Clue antibody staining of a Drosophila eye disc. And you can see that it's in predominantly all of the cells, but at varying levels, suggesting that clue levels may have a functional role in how it regulates uh, gene expression. If we look closer, we see that clue is in fact expressed in every R7 cell, which are outlined in red, making it a good candidate regulator of spineless. Okay, so next we wanted to see what would happen if we overexpressed clue, and we did this in three ways, with clue driving clue itself, a general eye driver driving clue, and an R7 specific driver driving clue. And in every case, we saw a significant decrease in the spineless on off ratio. So, this suggests to us that clue is a repressor of spineless that binds better in the presence of the low spineless SNP. So, we did the opposite experiment and we knocked it out. In a clue null situation, we saw a significant increase in the spineless on off ratio, and we saw a similar effect for a hypomorphic allele. Okay, so I just want to draw your attention uh, to this one observation we made that is when we overexpress clue, these lines seem to phenocopy lines with the low spineless SNP. So that suggests to us that maybe there's some relationship between um, clue levels and binding affinity and the spineless ratio. So just to summarize what I've shown you so far, in a clue null situation, we have zero clue levels and low binding affinity. In a wild type situation, we're now having endogenous levels of clue, and this causes a decrease from what we saw in the clue null. When we overexpress clue, we now have high clue, but still low binding affinity, and so we see another decrease in the ratio of spineless on to off cells. 
In a low spineless situation, uh, sorry, low spineless snip situation, we're back to medium levels of clue, but now high binding affinity. So we see a similar level of spineless on off as the high clue. And then finally, we did this experiment where we overexpressed clue in the presence of the SNP. So now we have high clue and high binding affinity, and this causes even further repression. So how does clue actually affect the ratio of spineless? We have two ideas about this, and one is that perhaps the variation in clue levels determines spineless expression. So we often think of identical cells as having identical amounts of protein, but we know that there are intrinsic differences. And so it's possible that there's a threshold for clue protein, and if clue is above this threshold, we get spineless off, and if it's below, we get spineless on, leading to the mosaic that we see. The second idea is that clue levels set a threshold for a completely independent mechanism that controls the spineless decision. So you can imagine if we increase clue levels, we'll be lowering that threshold for the other mechanism. And I think this is best explained with an example. So what I didn't tell you before is that this clue site overlaps with a predicted insulator element in spineless, of which there are five. And one of our favorite hypotheses in the lab is that these insulators interact to form different looping conformations that determine the spineless expression state. So it's possible that by clue binding to this site, it disrupts insulator function and biases this looping conformation towards the off state. We already have some preliminary evidence to suggest that these insulators are important for the spineless decision, as when we delete the second insulator, we get a complete loss of spineless expression. So this is an analysis that we'll be continuing in the future. So just to summarize, a single SNP can have many effects. It can cause, uh, in our case, it caused a low ratio of spineless, which ended up changing the color perception of flies. It increased clue binding affinity, and we determined that clue represses spineless. And our overall take home message is that stochastic gene expression is controlled by threshold levels of transcription factors uh, to low, binding to low affinity sites. Okay, so with that, I would just like to thank my PI, Bob Johnston. Uh, India Reese is an undergrad in the lab, and she did all of the behavior data. She, Cyrus Zhao, and Annie Cho all together did all of those 200 crosses and looked at spineless expression in those DGRP lines. And so with that, I'll take any questions. Hi. Um, a very basic question. Uh, you mentioned that you did um, CRISPR to add this SNP into a wild-type copy. But can you actually, do you put it in the same area, or can you actually put that sequence that you had color and put it in another area of the, of the, um, of, of spineless and see if you still have the same binding affinity? Uh, so in this experiment, we did it in the endogenous locus. Um, but we are planning on doing, we have several CRISPRs out for injection right now, and one of those is adding multiple of those binding sites. Um, in different areas to see if it has the same similar effect. Thank you. So uh, I know you said it was kind of hard to tell what the functional difference is between the, the SNP flies. Um, I know that, though I know that bees can actually uh, sense polarity of light. Have you looked at like polarity as one possible thing? Polarization? <laughs> uh, no, we haven't looked at that, but that's definitely something to look into. So uh, you mentioned that you got one SNP out of the GWAS from the DGRP. Do you think, did, did that look like it explained all of your variation that you were seeing? Or do you think if you made the statistical thresholds a little more lenient, you would pick up some other candidates that would at least be worth testing, maybe things in Clue itself? Definitely. Um, we use the most stringent multiple testing correction. So we definitely could have other significant SNPs if we were to lower that threshold. Uh, we started looking into them, um, but yeah, the low spineless SNP does not explain everything because it's not like it causes 100% spineless. So there are definitely other SNPs. Um, another problem might not be that we just don't have the power to pick them up if their allele frequency is too low. So um, yeah, but we're definitely looking into other variants as well. I'm also curious, could you speculate as to you know, the function of these different variants? So for example, whether there would be differences between summer and winter or different climates? 
Right? Yeah, that's a really interesting question is what is the evolutionary significance? Um, we show that they have different visual preference for the light, but what does that actually mean? Uh, and we're still in the process of thinking through that. My only guess is that perhaps it helps um, the flies fill various niches and maybe it has to do something with the climates and environments that they're in. But the fact is most of these DGRP lines are from the same place in North Carolina and we still see these differences, so it's hard to say. Okay, okay thank you.